subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates hello everybody welcome to daily news simplified an answer to what why and how of newspaper reading today we shall be analyzing the hindu newspaper dated 10th of jan 2021 of the new delhi edition the topics to be discussed today has been presented on your screen time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below let us begin our today's discussion now this particular article related to india's vaccination drive appears on both page number 1 as well as page number 9 this article shall be important from the perspective of gs paper 2 polity and governance particularly under the subsection management of health now based upon our discussion a main question for your practice here could be highlight the necessary steps taken by the government as part of the covid-19 vaccination drive in india also discuss the challenges which the government is likely to face in its vaccination drive as you must be aware presently in case of india almost around 9 covid-19 vaccines are at different stages of development out of these 9 vaccines three vaccines are at pre clinical trial phase whereas the remaining six vaccines are at clinical trial phase out of these six vaccines recently the government of india has decided to give emergency use authorization for two covid-19 vaccines these two vaccines are covishield which is manufactured by the serum institute of india in association with astrazeneca and oxford university the other vaccine is covaxin which is manufactured by bharat biotech limited in association with the indian council of medical research apart from that i hope all of you must be aware recently the government of india was carrying out the trial run of the covid-19 vaccines as part of such a trial run the government sought to understand as to what all logistical challenges it would face in its vaccination drive accordingly it has sought to plug these challenges as well as loopholes now based upon the experience of such a trial run now the government of india has decided to start off with the covid-19 vaccination drive from january 16 the vaccination drive in case of india it is considered to be the world's largest vaccination drive prior to this no country has ever attempted to vaccinate more than 1 billion population within a short period of time hence obviously india would face unprecedented challenges in carrying out the vaccination now these challenges may range from logistical and coordination challenges to vaccine hesitancy on part of the people hence as part of this particular video analysis will first and foremost understand as to what are government of india's plans with respect to covid-19 vaccination drive secondly we'll understand as to what challenges the government is likely to face in such a vaccination drive see it is not possible for us to vaccinate entire population of india at a single go we first need to vaccinate the priority group who are considered to be most vulnerable as well as susceptible to covid-19 infection we would also have to take into account the risk factor faced by different sections or the different age groups of indian society accordingly the government of india has planned to vaccinate 300 million most vulnerable group of indian society by the end of august 2021 the vaccines which are required to be administered that is be it the covid shield or the covaxin a person need to be administered with at least two dosages of either of these two vaccines in order to get the necessary immunity against the covid 19 so the government of india would approximately need 600 million dosages in order to vaccinate 300 million most vulnerable group now the beneficiaries that is those people who would be getting the covid 19 vaccine they are arranged in a form of priority the first priority would be given to the healthcare workers frontline workers and the population above 50 years of age the second priority is to be given to the population below 50 years of age 
with the associated comorbidities and the last priority is given to the remaining population and that to be based upon the vaccine availability. These beneficiaries would be identified through the electoral roll which has been prepared for both Lok Sabha as well as the state legislative assembly elections. See, in order to administer the COVID-19 vaccine to India's population, different set of activities are required to be carried out. For example, we need to procure the COVID-19 vaccines. We need to store them in the cold chain infrastructure. We need to transport them, provide for equitable distribution of the COVID-19 vaccines across multiple states, as well as across different regions in a single state. We would also have to provide for the necessary financing to buy these COVID-19 vaccines. So different set of activities are required to be carried out. Apart from that, if you have to administer the COVID-19 vaccine at an all India level, we need to have coordination at the highest level. This coordination has to be between center and states, coordination between multiple agencies and ministries at the central level, coordination between the agencies at the state level, as well as the coordination between the agencies at the district or the local level. Hence, in order to carry out all of these activities, as well as to ensure coordination at different levels of the government, the government of India has put in the necessary governance framework. At the highest level, that is at the central level, the government has set up the National Expert Group on Vaccine Administration for the COVID-19. Now, this particular National Expert Group is headed by a member of the Niti Aayog. Presently, it is headed by Mr. V.K. Paul. So, please do note that the National Expert Group is not headed by the Prime Minister. Rather, it is headed by a member of the Niti Aayog. Now, this particular National Expert Group is in turn responsible to give guidance on various aspects of COVID-19 introduction in case of India. Some of these aspects include selection of vaccines, that is, which vaccine should be selected in which particular region of India prioritization of beneficiaries, carrying out a surveillance related to the vaccine safety and all other aspects such as procurement, storage, transport, equitable distribution, financing and so on. Similar to National Expert Group on Vaccine Administration at the central level, at the state level we have set up the State Steering Committee which is headed by the Chief Secretary of the Concerned State. At the district level we have set up the District Task Force which is headed by the district collector or the district magistrate. And at a block level, we have set up the block task force, which is headed by the SDM or the Tessildar. Next, we have the COVIN, which also stands for COVID-19 Vaccine Intelligence Network. Now, this is basically a cloud-based IT solution, which can be used for different aspects of COVID-19 vaccination, such as it can be used for planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of the COVID-19 vaccination drive. As you can see here, this is basically a screenshot of what all COVID is capable of doing. It can be used for user management, inventory management, monitoring of temperature of the COVID-19 vaccines, registration of the beneficiaries, planning for the vaccination sessions, and it also provides analytics related to the COVID-19 vaccination drive. That is aspects such as how many people have already been vaccinated, how many are yet to be vaccinated, how many dosages are still remaining and all of those aspects. Apart from all of these aspects, as you can see through this particular portal, a beneficiary can do a self-registration on this particular portal. So on doing a self-registration, a beneficiary is eligible to get the COVID-19 vaccination. Now this particular diagram here basically shows the work process flow of how the COVID actually works. As you can see through the COVID, we can create a state and district level admins. That is those people who would be entitled to use this particular platform. We can also create a database of vaccinators as well as supervisors. We can manage various materials related to the COVID-19 vaccination. One can also do a bulk upload of the beneficiary data for the registration. And once a particular beneficiary gets vaccinated, a beneficiary is given a confirmation of the vaccination through a mobile app. This particular portal can also be used by the beneficiaries for reporting any kind of 
adverse effects or the side effects upon taking the vaccination. So as you can see the COVID or the COVID-19 vaccine intelligence network, it is a single stop solution for carrying out the vaccination drive. Coming now to the various challenges associated with the COVID-19 vaccination drive. The first challenge is with respect to poor status of vaccine management. And the second challenge is with respect to the ambitious target set by the government of India. See, as far as the first challenge is concerned, in the year 2018, the World Health Organization in association with UNICEF had carried out an assessment known as the Effective Vaccine Management Assessment. The main objective of carrying out this assessment was to understand the preparedness level of a country to undertake vaccination on a large scale. Now, this particular report ranked the different countries on various parameters such as the pre-shipment and arrival procedures, that is to what extent a country has simplified the procedures related to the arrival of the vaccines, the necessary infrastructure put in by a country with respect to cold chain infrastructure for storing the vaccines, the supply chain management established by a particular country as well as different other aspects as well. At a global level, the target was required to be at 80%. But as you can see, the color which is highlighted in orange here shows the performance in India as compared to the global target. On most of these parameters, India's performance is much below the global target. Now this clearly goes on to show that India's status of vaccine management is quite poor according to study carried out by the World Health Organization. So if you have to carry out the COVID-19 vaccination on such a large scale, then India would have to address all of these parameters in order to carry out this particular exercise efficiently. The second challenge is with respect to ambitious targets set by the government of India. Now, as highlighted before, the government of India requires almost around 600 million doses by the end of August 2021. However, as you can see here, the total distribution capacity of the government plus the private, this is hardly around 360 million doses, which clearly shows that by the end of August 2021, clearly the government as well as the private sector are not in a position to distribute 600 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine. The third challenge is with respect to choice of the vaccines. The government has come up with a clear plan to vaccinate 300 million most vulnerable group by the end of August 2021. However, even today, some questions remain unanswered. One among them is the choice of vaccines. Now, presently, there are two choices before us. That is, either it is Covishield or Covaxin. Going forward, more options may be available. But the question which has to be asked here is, who would choose as to which vaccine has to be administered in a particular state or a particular region of India? Would it be chosen by the center? Would it be chosen by the states? Or people, would they be free to choose the vaccines by themselves? This question, even today, has remained unanswered. The next question which has remained unanswered is over the funding pattern of the states. Now, presently, if you look at the universal immunization program, the cost of the vaccines is borne by both the center as well as states in 60 is to 40 ratio. Center bears 60 percentage of the cost and the states bear the remaining 40 percentage of the cost. However, even today, we have not been able to decide as to what would be the funding pattern for the COVID-19 vaccines. The next question which has remained unanswered is over the procurement of vaccines. See, presently in case of India, different vaccines have different prices. Usually, while undertaking procurement, the government follows the principle of the lowest bidder. That is, whichever private sector entity is willing to sell its goods and services, at the lowest prices to the government, the government would be procuring the goods and services from such an entity. But the question here is, will this principle be applicable even to the vaccine manufacturers? If that is the case, that is, if the government procures the vaccines only from the lowest bidder, then the government would not be able to procure 
600 million doses which is required to vaccinate 300 million people. The next important challenge, in fact the most important challenge is the vaccine hesitancy. See, according to FAQ published by the Union Health Ministry, vaccination for COVID-19 is voluntary. It is not mandatory. But some of the people, even today, they have certain apprehensions about the COVID-19 vaccines. These apprehensions are related to the safety, that is whether the COVID-19 vaccines, whether they are safe or not. Some people are apprehensive that it may lead to certain side effects or it can have certain adverse effects. So people may not come forward to get themselves vaccinated. Now this is going to the biggest challenge before the government of India. Accordingly, the government has to come out with a clear communication strategy. Now through such a clear communication strategy, the government should disseminate timely, accurate and transparent information about the vaccines. So that whatever misconceptions the people have about the COVID-19 vaccines, these misconceptions should be addressed and people come up voluntarily to get themselves vaccinated. Now these are some of the important aspects which one should know with respect to this particular article. With this, let us now take up the next article. Now this particular article appears on page number 6. The article is titled as Toy Making Cluster to be set up in Koppal. This article shall be important both from the perspective of prelims as well as mains. See the toy making in case of India, it is as old as the Indus Valley Civilization. In the Indus Valley Civilization, we came across number of toys such as the movable cart, circular and rectangular maze, dices of different shapes and so on. In the present day, toys from different states of India, they have been given the geographical indication tag. Some of these toys include the Tanjavur dolls from the state of Tamil Nadu, Chennapatna toys from the state of Karnataka, Kondapalli toys from the state of Andhra Pradesh. All of these toys have been given the geographical indication tag. However, presently India is not self-sufficient or Atmanirbhar as far as toy manufacturing is concerned. Almost 85% of toys in case of India are basically imported from countries such as China, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, etc. Accordingly, in order to ensure Atmanirbhar in toy manufacturing, Recently, Prime Minister Modi has called upon the entrepreneurs to focus upon the manufacturing of the indigenous toys in India. Accordingly, this particular article here highlights that India's first integrated manufacturing cluster of toys will be set up in Koppal in the state of Karnataka. So right now, we are focusing upon the clusters of the toys industries in order to ensure self-sufficiency in the toy manufacturing. From this particular discussion of ours, you should be in a position to answer this particular main question for the practice. The question here is, although a step in the right direction, ensuring self-sufficiency in the toy manufacturing is saddled with multifaceted challenges and concerns. Elucidate. So in this regard, what we will do as part of this particular video analysis is we will focus on different dimensions related to ensuring Atmanirbha Bharat or self-sufficiency in the toy manufacturing. Starting with the present status of the toy manufacturing. See the global toy market, it is as big as rupees 7 lakh crores. However, in spite of the fact that toy making in case of India has always been part of our tradition as well as culture, India's share in the global toy market, it is quite minuscule. It is mostly on the account of the fact that the toy manufacturing in case of India, it has come to be dominated by micro, small and medium enterprises whose scale of operation is quite lower. So in a way, we are not being able to compete with countries such as China in case of the toy manufacturing. That is precisely the reason most of the toys, in fact, 85% of the toys used in India are imported from countries such as China, Sri Lanka 
as well as Malaysia. Apart from that, the Bureau of Indian Standards, it has laid down the Indian Standards 9873 to be followed by all the toy manufacturing industries in order to ensure that the toys which are manufactured, they should be of good quality. However, according to the government's reports, almost 80% of the plastic toys manufactured in India, they fail the quality test. So as you can see, the present status of the toy manufacturing in India is quite poor. Accordingly, the government has come up with a vision to push the self-reliance in the toy manufacturing. Obviously, the objectives are multifold. These objectives include reduce the import of the cheaper toys from countries such as China, create more amount of employment opportunities, particularly among the rural artisans. Thirdly, according to a number of studies, it has been highlighted that regular usage of toys by the children would improve the psychomotor as well as cognitive skills of the children, leading to an improved learning outcomes. And lastly, since manufacturing of toys has always been part of our tradition as well as culture, by focusing on Atma Nirbhar Bharat in toy manufacturing, we would be able to promote our cultural heritage, our cultural values, and thus usher in the spirit of Ek Bharat and Shresh Bharat. Accordingly, the government has taken a number of initiatives in the recent times in order to give a boost or a thrust to the toy manufacturing. First and foremost, in the Union Budget 2020-2021, the Finance Minister has decided to increase the customs duty on the toys from 20% to 60%. So the Finance Minister has decided to undertake 200% increase in the customs duty on the toys. Secondly, the Bureau of Indian Standards has made it mandatory for all the domestic toy manufacturing industries to compulsorily comply with the BIS standards, that is standards as laid on under the IS 9873. And thirdly, as highlighted in this particular article, India's first toy manufacturing cluster is to be set up at Koppal in the state of Karnataka. However, in spite of these initiatives, still there are a number of concerns and challenges in order to ensure the self-sufficiency in the toy manufacturing. Let us understand these concerns and challenges one by one. First and foremost, obviously the first challenge is about the size of industry and the scale of operation undertaken in case of India. See the number of enterprises in China it is almost 10 times more than that of India. Moreover, the enterprises in China, they are much larger than that of India. So obviously India suffers a major lacunae in terms of the size as well as scale of operation. So when the toys are manufactured in China, these toys are much more cheaper as compared to the toys manufactured in India. Secondly, See, if you have to manufacture toys, we need basic raw materials such as plastic. Now, in case of China, access to these raw materials is considered to be much cheaper as compared to that of India. For example, according to government studies, the raw materials in case of China are at least 25% cheaper in comparison to India. The third problem is with respect to absence of skilled manpower. See, ideally, if we have to boost the toy manufacturing, we need to have the requisite skill set. And in order to have the requisite skill set, various institutes, including the IITs, should offer various courses with respect to designing of toys. But the problem here is most of the institutes do not offer separate courses on designing of toys. In fact, according to the government of India, Presently, if you want to get a PG diploma in toys designing, you can get it only from the National Institute of Design. So we need to widen the ambit of institutes that can offer the requisite skill set in order to design the toys. The next problem is with respect to the nature of product range as well as variety. So in case of India, over a period of time, there has been higher demand for the electronic toys as well as the battery operated toys. But the problem here is 
the domestic industries have not given due amount of emphasis on manufacturing of these categories of toys that is why most of the electronic toys and the battery operated toys are basically imported from china the next problem is with respect to poor product conceptualization as well as design if you have to design good toys if you want to have a good market for those toys then obviously the domestic industries would have to spend substantial amount of money on research and development in order to come up with a new design of the toys but the problem once again here is the domestic industries they do not spend adequate amount of money on research and development and most of the time they copy the designs from the chinese toys moreover there is lack of collaboration of these domestic manufacturing industries with institutes such as the national institute of design and the last problem is with respect to the poor marketing strategies see if you look at the indigenous toys in case of india particularly the toys such as the chenna patna toys tanjavur dolls etc there is huge scope to export these toys to the other countries however the industries which are involved in the manufacturing of these toys these industries do not have proper awareness as to what all procedures are required to be followed in order to boost the exports apart from that you must be knowing that in the recent times there has been rapid growth in the e-commerce companies such as amazon flipkart etc so ideally these domestic manufacturing companies should have leveraged these e-commerce companies to sell their goods that is why these domestic industries have not been able to tap the domestic market so if the government wants to realize its vision of ensuring the self sufficiency in the toy manufacturing then the government would have to address all of these concerns and challenges it would have multifaceted benefits not only in terms of ensuring the self sufficiency but it will also help india to promotes its heritage as well as culture so since the government of india is focusing on atmanirbhar bharat as well as vocal for local in prelims particularly from the perspective of art and culture we could get questions related to the indigenous toys of india so in order to prepare for this particular topic you should have an idea about the various indigenous toys of different states for example from karnataka we have the chenna patna in tamil nadu we have tanjavur in andhra pradesh we have two types of toys that is kondapalli and etti koppaka then in telangana we have the nirmal toys now the details of all the indigenous toys from different states have been provided in this particular pdf so i hope you would be able to go through this particular pdf on your own the link to this particular pdf has been provided in the description box below apart from that after going through this particular pdf please try to attempt some prelims based questions from this particular topic so these are some of the important aspects which one should know with respect to this particular article with this let us now take up the next article now this particular article appears on page number 6 the article is titled as kalari payar to academy braces for action this article shall be important from the perspective of prelims art and culture see kalari payar to it is considered to be an ancient martial art form from the state of kerala this ancient art form has been on constant decline hence in order to revive the kalari payar to kerala government has decided to set up a new academy hence from the perspective of the prelims examination one would be required to understand certain basic details about the kalari payar to as well as the details of the other martial art forms from various parts of india as far as the kalari payar to is concerned the word kalari payar to it is derived from the word known as kalari whose meaning is battlefield so kalari payar to is basically a martial art form which was designed for the ancient battlefield it uses various kinds of weapons as well as combative techniques which are considered to be quite unique to india according to some of the legends the kalari payar to it is almost 3000 years old and its origin has been traced to sage parshurama who is considered to be the master of all the martial art forms kalari payar to uses a number of combative techniques such as strikes kicks grappling weaponry 
Not just that, it also includes some healing methods. Some of the practitioners of Kalari Payattu, they pose intricate knowledge of various pressure points on the human body. Accordingly, these healing techniques have incorporated the knowledge of both Ayurveda as well as Yoga. Apart from Kalari Payattu, we do have martial art forms of other states starting with Silambam which comes from the state of Tamil Nadu. Now, Silambam as you can see in this particular picture, it is basically a weapon based Indian martial art form which originated in the south part of India. This style has also been mentioned in the Tamil Sangam literature as well. The next martial art form is Gatka from the state of Punjab. Now the word Gatka, it is associated with the wooden sticks which are used as part of this particular martial art form. The next martial art form is the Mushti Yuddha. It has originated from the northern part of India. Now if you look at the word Mushti Yuddha, it basically means fist fighting. Now this form of combat has also been referenced in both Rig Veda as well as Ramayana. The next art form is Thangta from the state of Manipur. Now this particular martial art form uses both swords as well as spears. The next martial art form is Lati Kela from the state of Bengal. As you can see here, in this particular martial art form, wooden sticks are being used. Next is the Mardani Khel from the state of Maharashtra. The next martial art form is Parikhanda from the state of Bihar. Now this particular art form has been created by Rajputs. The steps used in this particular art form are also used in the Chow dance. The next art form is the Kati Samu from the state of Andhra Pradesh. So if you look at the word Kati Samu, the word Kati here stands for sword. So Kati Samu is a martial art form that uses the swords along with the sheets. The next art form is Thoda from the state of Himachal Pradesh. Now this martial art form is normally seen in the Kullu Manali Valley. And as you can see in this particular picture, it basically uses bows as well as spears for fighting. See, as far as the prelims examination is concerned, there is no need for you to go into detail of each and every martial art form. You should basically understand as to which martial art form comes from which of the states. That alone should be sufficient. With this, let us now take up the next article. Now, this particular article appears on page number 11. This article shall be important from the perspective of prelims, science and technology. This article highlights the significance of a new category of bacteria discovered by the scientists recently. This category of bacteria is referred to as the Geobacter. In this regard, let us understand the significance of Geobacter. See, Geobacter, it is a category of bacteria which is found in the soil as well as sediment. Because of the nature of functions and the significance of its functions, Geobacter has recently been nicknamed by the scientists as the Iron Man. See, cobalt, it is considered to be a valuable and scarce metal. It is used in batteries. However, a cobalt is considered to be toxic to both human beings as well as microorganisms. Cobalt penetrates the cell of the microorganisms and in turn kills them. However, when Geobacter encounters a cobalt, Rather than cobalt killing the geobacter, the geobacter extracts the metal from the rust of cobalt. So in a way, the geobacter is extracting the cobalt from the soil. This cobalt which is extracted is in turn used by the geobacter to prepare a protective coating around its body. So because of how the geobacter works when it encounters cobalt, the scientists have decided to nickname this as the Iron Man. The significance of this particular bacteria is that first and foremost, it will help in bioremediation. That is through the usage of microorganisms such as Geobacter, we would be able to break down the pollutants and improve the natural environment. And secondly, we would be able to recycle the scarce cobalt metal and then we can use it back in the batteries. This article is quite important because as you can see in prelims 2018, there was a question related to the advantages of the bioremediation. The first statement here was, it is a technique 
for cleaning up the pollution by enhancing the same biodegradation process that occurs in nature. This statement here is correct. The second statement here is any contaminant with heavy metals such as cadmium and lead can readily and completely treated by bioremediation using microorganisms. Now here this statement since it is an extremely worded statement which says that it can undertake complete bioremediation this statement here is wrong. The third statement is genetic engineering can be used to create microorganisms specifically designed for bioremediation. This statement here is correct. Accordingly, the right answer to this particular question is C. That is 193 only. Now the next article appears on page number 6. The article is titled as Drop in Visitors at Banagatta National Park. I hope all of you must be aware that Banagatta National Park is located in the state of Karnataka near Bangalore. This article also makes a mention about Rangantittu Bird Sanctuary. Hence, from the perspective of the prelims examination, let us understand certain basic details about the Rangantittu Bird Sanctuary located in the state of Karnataka. Now, as you can see in this particular map, the Rangantittu Bird Sanctuary, it is located on the bank of river Kaveri near Mysore. This Rangantittu Bird Sanctuary basically comprises of five islets on the bank of river Kaveri. This sanctuary is named after the Hindu god Sri Ranganath Swami who is also considered to be an incarnation of Lord Vishnu. Now according to a number of experts, one can come across at least 170 bird species in this particular sanctuary. This sanctuary is also considered to be Karnataka's largest bird sanctuary. During winters, this particular sanctuary also attracts a number of migratory birds from Siberia and Latin America. See, normally in prelims, questions are asked with respect to location of important tiger reserves, wildlife sanctuaries and the bird sanctuaries. So from the perspective of the prelims examination, please make a note of Rangan Tittu bird sanctuary. Now the last article appears on page number 11, that is the science and technology page. The article is titled as Harnessing what Einstein called the spooky action at a distance. Now this particular article basically talks about the quantum computing as well as quantum entanglement. Now the various aspects of quantum computing including the quantum entanglement have already been discussed in our DNS dated 6th of December 2020. In this particular DNS video, we have started our discussion with how quantum computers are different from the classical computers. We have also highlighted about various aspects of quantum computing. So since all the aspects related to this particular article have recently been covered in our DNS dated 6th of December 2020, we would not be repeating this particular article once again. Those of you who have not gone through this particular DNS related to quantum computing, I suggest you to go through this DNS. The link to this particular DNS has been provided in the description box below. With this, we have come to the end of today's discussion. Now let us have a look at the question for the day. 